Hey everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Tina Talks Gaming. Today, I want to talk to you about a game that wasn't even on my radar up until a few months ago. But once I found it, I cannot stop playing. I'm Tina, and today, let's talk about Across the Obelisk. Across the Obelisk was developed and published by DreamSight Games. Released to Steam Early Access April 8, 2021. Priced at $19.99 US dollars. It is a co-op, that's right, I said co-op, deck building, RPG, roguelike game. I seriously cannot find any other game like it. And spoiler alert, I'm obsessed. If you know of any, I would love to hear your suggestions in the comments. I will mention one more time that this game is still in early access. It's still missing its fourth act as well as some characters. The developers plan to release this sometime in February. That makes this the perfect time to jump into this game if you haven't already. Even in the game's current state, I feel it's well worth its asking price. I'm telling everyone I know they should play it. And now I'm going to tell you why you should too. Across the Obelisk offers three modes. Adventure mode. Here you'll discover new characters, unlock cards, and fight evil bosses in a roguelite adventure. In challenge mode, every game will be different as you progress through the void trying to reach the obelisk. And in weekly challenge, you can compete against other players. Each week, a new set of rules and fixed characters await. See who can get the top score. When you start the game though, you'll only have access to adventure mode, so we are going to focus on that for this video. In Across the Obelisk, you alone, or with up to three friends, build a party of four heroes. There are 10 unique heroes to choose from in total, with plans to add more in the future, and four standard classes that you would expect to see in a party-based game. Warrior, Scout, Mage, and Healer. And each character has slight variations in the types of cards they have, and they require different strategies when fighting enemies and building decks. You can get creative in the teams you build. The game lets you mix it up with characters and classes so that you can create the party that you want. And with over 500 cards in the game, creating unique and powerful decks is fun and easy. As you progress, your characters will become stronger. Each run, you will gain perk points. These points add bonuses to your character. These upgrades are also permanent and will travel with your character through all future runs. There are also three different skins for each character. And as a person that really enjoys customizing my character in games, this is absolutely a welcome addition for me. You do have to rank up your character in order to unlock them. But for me, that provides even more incentive to level up. When you begin your adventure, whether you're playing solo or with friends, you will be taken to the Kingdom of Synthia. The first area on the map is the starting town. You'll always start here at the start of a run, as well as after you defeat the boss and cross over to a new area. Once in town, you have access to five different places. If you're playing solo, you need to worry about gearing up your entire party of four. Whereas if you're playing with a group of four friends, for example, each person would only be responsible for one character. For me, playing with four friends is where I had the most fun with this game and what makes it so different from all the rest. I still spent a fair amount of time in single player, don't get me wrong, but co-op is where this game shines. This game is a rogue light, not a rogue like. Simply meaning that when you die, there are things from your run that carry over into your next run. You will receive town upgrade points at the end of a run that can be applied here. These are permanent upgrades. Each shop has its own tree, and each upgrade reduces costs for that area. In addition to town upgrades and perk upgrades, you can claim the rewards from your previous game. Use them to buy items, upgrade cards, and make your party stronger. So even though you were defeated, it doesn't quite feel like all is lost. 
At the altar, you can upgrade the cards that are in your deck. The higher rarity of the card, the higher the cost to upgrade it. The Magic Forge allows you to craft cards that you've unlocked. This will also cost shards to do, and those shards can go quickly, especially if you have four characters to worry about. Next, we have the Armory. This is the equipment shop where you can buy items for gold. There is only one of each item, so you'll have to discuss with your team and decide which item works best for which character. This is also where you'll find any pets that you've unlocked. Again, there is only one of each available in the shop. You can use the church to remove any cards you want from your deck, as long as you still have the minimum number of cards required, which is 15. You can spend gold at the Zingarian cart to unlock a divination round. The more you spend, the higher the rarity of the cards. Once everyone is geared up and ready to go, it's time to begin your journey across the obelisk. It's now time to decide which path you'll take to get there. If you're playing co-op, you'll all have to agree on the same space. If not, the game will roll for a winner, and the group will travel down that path. I found combat in this game to be ridiculously fun. While the mechanics are simple to understand, complex strategies can still be applied. Let's quickly go over the basics. The bar at the top shows your turn order. This is determined based on the character's speed. Below that, you'll see the round number and your performance bar. Performance is based on how many rounds it takes you to win combat. Your deck can be seen in the bottom left corner, and to the right, you'll find your energy. This can also be found under the health bar as well as the items your character has equipped. Each enemy type has its own unique set of strengths and weaknesses. Luckily, the game tells you what they are and you can plan accordingly. Each card costs energy to play. The cost can be found in the top left corner. Some cards are focused on attack while others are focused on defense. Some cards can only be used on your hero while others can be used on all heroes or any heroes. Each class of character plays very different from one another, and each requires a different strategy to be successful. Strategizing with your team about how you're going to take down the enemies in your path is the best part of this game. Depending on which character it is, certain cards will have limits as well, but that just means you have to strategize with your team and plan the best course of action. Strategy is really important in this game. Once you win combat, your characters will all be given a choice of three different cards, or you can take shards instead. You may also get performance bonuses depending on how fast you are able to complete combat, though this is not something you should get hung up on, especially if you're just starting out. Each time you succeed in battle, your deck and character become stronger. But as your power grows, so does your enemies. The enemy types in each area vary. Each has their own strengths and weaknesses, and they differ from area to area. There are currently three different areas in the game, with one planned to be added February 2022. As you progress through the game, you'll encounter random story events. Here, you and your team will have to decide what the best course of action is. You can see by hovering over the die in the bottom right corner what the probability of success will be before you roll. Depending on whether or not you pass or fail the skill check will affect how the story unfolds. These events can have both positive and negative effects on your party. They can even sometimes provide you with unique items that you can use later on to gain unique rewards. You will also encounter challenges which can be used to gain unique rewards as well. But man, these challenges are hard. Most of the time, for me, the risk outweighs the reward. But don't be afraid to try creative things. Test out some party combinations and see if you can find some well-working synergies. It can be really worth it. And remember, in order to get more powerful, you need to die. A lot. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done! So don't feel bad about it and have fun. Not to mention, when you've been defeated time and time again, and you and your friends finally take on that boss and kick his <coughs> victory tastes that much sweeter. I'm having an absolute <laughs> blast with this game. Also, I want to quickly mention that I absolutely love the art style. 
I think the hand-drawn characters work really well. Also, there's tons of different attack animations and they all look really amazing. As well as the music and sound effects in the game. You really get into a rhythm after a while. And that boss battle music is just oh so good. And I really wish more people were playing it. I'd have to give this game a 9 out of 10. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I hope you'll check out Across the Obelisk if you haven't already. Here in the next couple weeks, we're going to be covering Horizon Forbidden West and a game called Sunnyside, which if you don't know about, it's going to be big. I hope to see you next week, and I hope we can talk more games again soon. Bye!